Hello and welcome to Thursdays for the Soul. I am your host today, Jennifer White. Thursdays for the Soul is a webinar series for the whole church where we faithfully focus on care and education for the people of God. And we create opportunities to digitally worship together as the whole of the United Church of Christ. We feature things from prayer, music, and psalms to key interviews of leaders and how-tos in congregational life. This series stays current to the relevant topics of the time and offers opportunities of connection in the wider church and in your community. Together, we can bring our church and the world towards the world God imagines for all of us. We have some upcoming sessions. Thursday, September 22nd, we will have shared learning from the disarmament movement. We have testified, protested, advocated, written letters, made calls, held vigils, and prayed, weeped, and comforted. And after March 22nd, 2021 massacre in Boulder, our faith communities demanded action. We could no longer be satisfied with being just another staff. Although it would have been easy to be overwhelmed with the complexity and scope of gun violence prevention, we knew we must do something, anything, and we had to start immediately. Peacemaking action was required urgently, and there's no time to be, there was no time to be afraid. You'll hear from faith leaders in Colorado as they share their experiences, lessons learned, and best practices in transforming trauma and catalyzing a, a nationwide disarmament movement. Next week, the national setting of the United Church of Christ is hosting an all church summit where we will envision a, what a vibrant, vibrant and healthy church looks like as it emerges from the pandemic. This virtual gathering will run from Monday, September 19th through Wednesday, September 21st. We'll engage with provocative speakers like Reverend Dr. Dr. Jackie Lewis, Reverend Malcolm Mal uh, Michael Malcolm, and Reverend Dr. Jim Zetta Ferguson. You'll have a chance to share your own experiences from the pandemic, where you'll see God in these in these times, and you'll you can have partner in creating this next evolution of church. And if you can't even join live, the $50 registration fee includes a lifetime access to all of the recordings and the large group sessions through Frontline Faith. Scholarships are still available. Registration closes today at midnight Eastern. Uh, so you'll want to visit ucc.org forward slash UCC Summit. I'll drop that in the chat and it'll be in the resources below the YouTube description. As usual, you can visit ucc.org or any of our social media platforms to find out sessions just like this. Beloveds, if these conversations move you, if what's offered here helps enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider don donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ. You can do that by texting UCC to 41444. As you know, your prayerful and financial support helps programs just like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you. Today's program, it's a part of a special series of Thursdays for the Soul, where we fo focus on one of the 12 Just World Covenant programs in the United Church of Christ. The United Church of Christ was the first Christian denomination to declare itself Just Peace Church in 1985. Over the past 35 plus years, my lifetime, the, <laughs> the concept of just peace, that intersection of peace with justice reflected in the biblical vision of God's shalom has been affirmed by ecumenical partners around the world. As our world suffers from conflicts around the world, world now is the time to seek alternatives to militarism and our turn to focus on building peace from the ground up. Today, we will introduce to you concepts of just peace and highlight ways in which local churches are living out their just peace identity. We'll also lift up our 2022 theme for Just Peace Sunday, the disruptive power of peace, friendship, justice, and security. To be celebrated on Sunday, September 18th, speakers for this webinar will include members of UCC's Just Peace Network and Steering Committee. Friends, let me introduce you to my new friend, Sheila Harvey. Hello, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be with you.
for today's webinar with the topic being Just Peace Churches and the Disruptive Power of Peace. We are excited to talk with you today about what that means and how you might engage with us in doing so. First, I would like to introduce my esteemed colleague. His name is Michael Nuroff. Some of you may know him. And we are very fortunate, hello Mike, to work with him. He is our staff person for all things Just Peace. And so we will welcome him as well. And later we will hear from Denise. Hello, Denise. Uh, Denise uh, does has done some wonderful work in Just Peace in the Pacific Northwest. And so I am uh, Reverend Dr. Sheila Harvey and so pleased to serve as the chair of the Just Peace Network Steering Committee. Um, Mike will now give us a little bit of history and overview about right. Just Peace. Well, thank you, Sheila, and hello, everyone. Uh, as Sheila said, I'm Reverend Michael Neurath. I serve you as our UCC policy advocate for international issues uh, here in the office on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, a place where you are always welcome to come and be with us in witness and protest and advocacy whenever you are in our nation's capital. Um, to start with, I'm gonna ask your forgiveness. Um, I currently have COVID and um, not feeling 100%. So you may hear some scratchiness in my voice uh, and I am doing my best to be present with you and I'm excited to be with you and I'm grateful that I can be with you and I'd give you this nasty virus that uh, has infected so many of us um, and is now going around my own household. So um, I'm grateful for this time with you and what we thought of doing to start off to give you all an overview of what Just Peace is as part of this uh, webinar series of the various covenants for a just world um, is we want to start with a video that we, uh, the steering committee created for the General Synod in 2015 when we marked 30 years as a Just Peace Church. And so I'm going to turn it to Jennifer to go ahead and start that video and hope you all will enjoy it. In 1985, amidst a context of the Cold War and the persistent challenges of racism, homophobia, poverty, environmental crisis, and economic disparity, a church makes a bold proclamation toward a more hopeful future. What do we want? Peace! When do we want it? Now! A vision grounded in shalom peace with justice, making the audacious claim that peace is possible. 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 At the 15th General Synod in 1985, the United Church of Christ became the first Christian denomination to declare itself a just peace church. It defined just peace as the vision of shalom, linking peace and justice, calling for the interrelation of friendship, justice, and common security from violence. UCC President Robert V. Moss wrote, we now need to put as much effort into defining a just peace as we have done in the past in defining a just war. Churches across the country went through a process of discernment to declare themselves just peace churches. Scholars, activists, and theologians began to develop the just peace paradigm and 10 just peacemaking practices. Over the past 30 years, the just peace paradigm has been affirmed by ecumenical and interfaith partners. In 2013, Just Peace was affirmed by the World Council of Churches, which issued a statement on the way of Just Peace and called on churches to join a pilgrimage of justice and peace, calling on churches to work for 
just peace in the community so that all may live free from fear. Just peace with the earth so that life is sustained. Just peace in the marketplace so that all may live with dignity. Just peace among the nations so that human lives are protected. Arise, O oh Lord, lift up your hand. Hands up, don't shoot. In 2015, we mark the 30th anniversary of the Just Peace pronouncement, calling on all settings of the United Church of Christ to renew our commitment to just peace and declare in a new time amidst new challenges our belief that peace is possible. To be a just peace church is a rich and expansive faith mandate based in scripture and resonant in God's unfolding history. Ever more connected between the global and the local the corporate and the individual. The pressing issues of our world may change, but the need to work actively for peace does not. God's peace, shalom, lies at the unity of justice and peace in the world. An enduring commitment to this principle affirms to the world that peace is possible. Indeed, it is the only way that peace is possible. All right, thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, I've seen the video many times and I'm always struck with just how, um, how well it captures a lot of the principles of just peace. Uh, but I'm going to, to tease some of that out a little bit further because it's quick in the video. And that video is, by the way, available on our website for use in your local church um, or to view again to, to take it all in. But I want to start with that quote that, um, that is quoted in, in the video from the UCC's second general minister and president, Reverend uh, Robert V. Moss. And he wrote in 1971, so this is before we declared ourselves a just peace church. This is in 1971, Reverend Moss writes, uh, quote, although the doctrine of just war is a venerable one in the church, it is becoming increasingly clear that the classical criteria which the theologians have used to classify wars as just or unjust will no longer serve. In our kind of world, war has become dysfunctional. We now need to put as much effort into defining a just peace as we have done in the past in defining a just war." End quote. Well, certainly if war was dysfunctional in 1971, uh, it is even more so today uh, it, as more asymmetrical war and many other forms of, of war making like armed drones and killer robots and, and all kinds of different uh, uh, way technologies have come have emerged since the mid 70s. Uh, so the sense of, of the need to, to move beyond uh, this criteria of, of just war was in the mid 70s and into the early 80s in the midst of the Cold War, a concern for our churches, for our denomination. Uh, following the civil rights and the anti-apartheid movements uh, the UCC was looking at these challenges of our time and sought a third way beyond just war and also uh, beyond pacifism. That, that there was a sense in the UCC that that also, uh, that pacifism itself wasn't uh, enough, wasn't, didn't offer as much of an engaged approach that was more authentic to who we thought, who we believe to be as the United Church of Christ, uh, as a denomination deeply committed to addressing issues of systemic injustice. It was, a, at the time, it was felt like those two historic traditions, neither of them really stopped us from engaging in continued wars or rapidly escalating militarism. So at the time, in the mid 80s, just peace was a concept that was being developed in various circles, including in our own church. And, and as the video said, we were the first to identify ourselves 
as a Just Peace Church in 1985. And in doing so, the way we articulated it is as through the vision of shalom, the biblical notion of shalom linking peace with justice together. We called for the interrelation of friendship, justice, and common security from violence, uh, which I think if you think of each of those three concepts separately, this notion of friendship, uh, that how we as people must be called to refuse to be enemies with each other. Concept of justice that underlies so much of our work in the United Church of Christ and, and even beyond justice, the, the need to address systemic justice, like systemic racism uh, and common security that ultimately, we, that's what the vision that we all aspire to, the vision in Micah where each can have their own uh, fig tree um, and have enough. This holistic vision and intersectional vision really is what the UCC was called to. Um, the pronouncement put the United Church of Christ uh, in opposition to the institution of war. Uh, it's not a pacifist statement, but it, it puts us opposed to the institution of war. So essentially kind of concerns about the military industrial complex as President Eisenhower articulated it. But it also offered prophetic hope the hope that war can and must be eliminated and that peace is possible. In the video, you hear those voices of the children, one of which is my son saying peace is possible. And as the UCC, we are a community that holds out that hope for the world that is indeed possible. And that working for just peace is some of the ways in which we can make that hope a reality. Um, Ultimately though, just peace emphasizes the interconnection, the intersection between peace and justice, uh, that there is no justice without peace. So in the mid eighties and nineties, churches declared themselves just peace churches. And we'll talk a bit about from Sheila and Denise about that process. Um, but just to say, bring up to speed in the past few years of what has emerged is that, for example, the World Council of Churches has lifted up the concept of just peace. Uh, Sheila and I just returned from the assembly, World Council of Churches General Assembly, in which just peace remains a central call uh, by the global ecumenical community uh, as a point of connection across all, uh, all global churches. And the WCC articulated it in the forms of the call to build just peace with the earth, just peace in the marketplace, just peace in the community, and just peace among the peoples and nations. And I'd be happy to tease those concepts out, but very much it's a, it's a, it's we, that we are called to, to engage in environmental justice, economic justice, global justice, and justice and peace in our own communities. Finally, in 2015, we marked an anniversary of 30 years as a Just Peace Church, which was the occasion upon which that video was created. Uh, and we brought a new resolution to General Synod that was affirmed unanimously, which not only uh, incorporated some of the documents of the World Council of Churches, <clears throat> but also affirmed the work of uh, our own UCC theologian, Susan Thistlethwaite, who through the years had subsequently developed just peace practices, which are really powerful uh, practice norms of how to build peace locally and around the world. And finally, it called on the United Church of Christ to mark Just Peace Sunday, uh, the Sunday before September 21st each year. And I'll say a little bit more about that later in this webinar. Uh, but as Jennifer mentioned, Just Peace has also been part of the Just World Covenant Hub which is a new development just over the past year. And that site is now bringing us into conversation with the other designations in the United Church of Christ, such as Open and Affirming and Green Church and Immigrant Welcoming Churches. Um, so there's a lot happening. And uh, my two colleagues here, Sheila and Denise, are at the at the center of a lot of that work. So let me turn it next, maybe back to you, uh, Sheila. Thank you so much, Mike. I love the way that you ground us in the history and, and give us so much um, information about what it means to be a Just Peace Church 
and our colleague Denise is about 30 miles from fires from where she is. And so she's been having some connection issues. She wanted to share with you some of the exciting work that has been done over the years in the Pacific Northwest, where she has worked with local churches and the conferences there. And um, we hope that she will be able to join us again. I will go ahead and share with you some of the things that my local church has done and um, how we have been involved in the Just Peace movement. We have been very excited to be a part of the Just Peace movement through the years. It has become such a vital part of who we are as a church that in many ways we identify ourselves as such. Uh, for instance, we have been incorporating not only sermons and worship time, but also Bible studies, book studies, even trips, things to educate us on the various issues related to justice and peace. And so that's gotten us involved even locally as well. So I just want to share that it is very uh, good to explore becoming a justice and peace church if you haven't done so already. And some, so many people um, designated themselves as a just peace church many years ago, and maybe it's time to revitalize that effort. Um, and so we invite you to do that as well. One of the things that Mike said is that we just returned from the World Council of Churches General Assembly in Germany. It was wonderful in so many ways to connect with 110 nations representing more than a half a billion Christians. And during that time, it was so heartening to hear the leaders um, on the stage and even in our workshops. Mike and I gave a workshop on Just Peace as well. Um, so much attention was given to the importance of justice and peace. And one of the things I'd like to read um, is a verse from the Bible because so many people ask, well, is this biblical and is this a biblical mandate? In the Psalm, it says, Psalm 72, verse three, it says, let there be peace and justice throughout the land known on every mountain and hill. Peace and justice is rooted in our faith on so many levels. Here in the Florida Conference, which is where I'm located, um, we just recently had a, a Just Peace event in the Southern Conference, and it was the first time we had done something here like this in the Southern region. And we were very pleased to have Susan Thistlethwaite, who you saw in the video, uh, offer a theological reflection. We were happy to have our immediate past general minister and president, Joffrey Black, who is very much a part of this uh, revitalization effort for just peace, as well as our DC office represented with the director, uh, Sandy Sorensen, along with Mike. We had some wonderful Q&A and discussion. So, there's a lot happening here um, at the local level, at the regional and conference levels in regards to justice and peace. And I think Reverend Denise is trying to come back on and she can chime in as uh, she is able. Can you hear us, Denise? Are you back with us? Okay. Well, mm -hmm. as, as she's trying to come back on, we want to share with you um, some practical links that you can um, go to uh, to either become a Just Peace Church or renew your church as being a Just Peace Church. And they are presented uh, for you. Um, they will be emailed to you as a follow up in terms of resources. And we invite you to look into that and see if this is something good for your ministry context. We believe it will be, and we are here to be a resource as well. Can, can you describe those two documents for folks? Oh, why sure, I can do right. that. <laughs> well, the first document is a handout and our team worked um, diligently on that and we were very excited to share a handout that gives the theological framework 
for what it means to be a just peace church, some examples of churches that are just peace churches and some of the things that they're doing, um, which includes West Palm Beach, where I am, um, as well as Clackamas and um, other places. We also have the 10 step document uh, that you will see. And it's, it's a very simple um, process and it just walks you through it. And so many uh, churches who have gone through this process says it's been very helpful and we hope that it's helpful for you as well. And so we invite you to read over those documents, to revisit the history um, of what it means to be a just peace church and the biblical grounding for it. And um, as Mike mentioned, it talks about the World Council of Churches involvement in just peace. And what is so exciting is that the United Church of Christ was the first denomination to declare itself a just peace church. And now the whole world <laughs> is speaking about the importance of justice and peace. And so it looks like we have Reverend Denise back. She has so much energy around this. Um, if she can unmute and we can hear her energetic voice <laughs> about uh, some of the things that she's done. I hope I can stay connected. I just had all my power go out. The lights went out. I am out here in uh, Milwaukee, Oregon, just south of Portland, and we keep having intermittent power shutdowns to kind of stem the wildfire activity out here. So I never know when I'm going to have any juice or not. So I am so sorry. Uh, I may lose you, but I'm going to try to hang with you a little bit. I've been involved with the Just Peace Movement since it started in 1985. I was at seminary in Chicago and served at University Church with Susan Thistlethwaite from 1985 through being their pastor and interim pastor before I graduated from seminary. And so I've been involved with this movement since really the beginning. And I believe that University Church was the first Just Peace Church. So I served that church. I also uh, worked with the Just Peace Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Plymouth, Congregational UCC. Shout out to their fantastic work. But I came out here to Oregon uh, almost like 30 years ago. And when I got here, there were only two Just Peace Churches, one in um, Ashland, close to our Southern Oregon University, and the other in Corvallis, which is by Oregon State. So there was a real college campus progressive movement towards just peace in the community as well as the church. And when I came out to Clackamas Church, uh, they were in the process of becoming a open and affirming church. And I said, why not consider also being just peace? So we, we did, we proceeded with that. They became a just peace church, which of course has to encompass being open and, and affirming. So as we're emerging from this pandemic and the isolation that we're experiencing, we're kind of moving out of the survivalist mode back into active compassion and justice seeking activities at our churches, who many have not been meeting, right? So it's been difficult. Some of the direct outreach stuff is, is, is tough to do when you're not together. So churches in my conference, the Central Pacific Conference, have asked me, what can they do? What can they do for outreach when they aren't even gathering together? And the common question is, so what can we do now in this you know, pandemic in these last couple of years? So our Just Peace churches have really led others over the last two years by their example of their Just Peace practices that continued regardless of the struggles of these last two years. So even with internal struggles of their own in churches, some had economic hardship, members fell off, illness, even death. They had to reach out even further into their community to do just peace work with whatever resources that they had. You know, it's the time, talent, and very creative funding because tithes aren't always there in this period of time. 
So over half the churches in our conference are just peace churches. And I said, when I moved to Portland, there were only two and Clackamas became the third. And now half of our churches are just peace churches in the Central Pacific Conference. So I think, yeah, I think that we're tiny, we're small, you know, so that's like 25 churches, but really it's a lot. It covers Oregon, Southern Washington and uh, Southern Idaho. So we, we have a spread, you know, we, we are small, but, but we're all spread out. So I believe that the movement has grown because we've had support from conference ministers because I've been driving it. I came with a just peace focus. I led my church with a just peace focus as a local pastor. Then I became chair of the justice and witness ministry team. So I could push it from there and encourage other churches to do it and go through the steps and the process and write a covenant. And I think just having a person that had it be their ministerial focus helped other churches to embrace the just peace movement as well. So since then, I have kind of spread my attention between all our Just Peace churches and trying to encourage the other churches to become Just Peace churches because so many of them just go, oh, yeah, we just have to write a covenant. Oh, yeah, we really are Just Peace, but we haven't got to that. We'll get to it because it really isn't difficult. And I believe that during this pandemic, it was the Just Peace churches that kept the most active. When I looked at a list of all our churches in our conference, the ones that thrived, that kept going, were the ones that had a ministerial Just Peace focus. So I just want to tell you some of the things that have been happening in the last couple of years at a few of our churches out here in the Central Pacific Conference. Uh, first of all, Corvallis UCC, one of our first Just Peace churches, and Park Rose, which is in Portland, and Bridgeport, which is in Portland, all built homes on their property for the houseless, actually on their church property during COVID. So each of them have at least 10 houses on property and that's growing. And of course, sometimes they had resistance from the neighbors, but they soon all embraced it. And now I'm very pleased to visit those churches and see their houseless developments right on their property. Might take half the parking lot or move into a field, but they're doing that kind of work. Um, Lincoln City UCC in Oregon on the coast is the church with Charles Bush that started Peace Village. And many churches around the UCC have embraced that model for Peace Village. I'm very proud of the work that they did and continue to do. Ashland and Medford, keep them in their prayers. They're just peace churches, and they are down there in the thick of fire still. Klamath Falls as well. And one of their main focuses the last couple of years has been fire outreach and helping those who have lost their homes in fires get homes, collect um like mobile homes and campers and, and put them in a field so people have a place to stay, uh, getting them food, making sure that power is up and running in those areas. Outside of Ashland, we lost an entire town called Talent to fire, wiped out, completely wiped out. And many members of that church had lived in Talent. So also Clackamas UCC, my home church where I served for 27 years, and pass the reins off to Adam Erickson, who is an amazing uh, voice for peace and justice, and particularly a just peace. They have um, established a community garden with somebody in their community. So now we're working on food resources there. They built an accessible playground. They do uh, direct food outreach to folks in the neighborhood who have food insecurity. And of course, if you look on their website and even on the UCC websites, you'll see that they have a very brave sign that they put on their street that uh, speaks to peace and justice and offers hope to people passing. And certainly you can tell where they stand on all issues of just peace. There are so many other churches that have been very involved but I will say that I think the churches that are just peace churches have been the most active in times it could be stagnant. So we have also done advocacy work the last couple of years in Ceasefire, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, emerging food resource programs, um, economic justice, healthcare for all, racial justice, 
immigrant justice, pride events and activities, and earth justice, and more. And if you've even watched the news, you see how Portlanders take it to the street for issues. And many of our UCC churches have been marching and sign waving, even in their own parking lots for people who pass by. So injustices root causes are fear and insecurity. What more fear and insecurity could we have had than in the last two years? And what makes an outreach project just peace? And I think it's intent. The intent and intention is to work for justice that will instill true peace, a peace that offers security and alleviates fear. So I encourage all of you to take the steps to become a Just Peace Church. You have partners out there in the denomination that are happy to work with you. I'm happy to work with you. You can contact me anytime. And I want us to join together as we journey forward for Just Peace and a disruptive Just Peace. Right? Amen? Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you so much, Denise, for sharing all of the wonderful work happening in the Pacific Northwest. And thank you so much for your years of service in this regard. We do want to circle back to Reverend Mike Moroff, um, who will talk about Just Peace Sunday, which is right around the corner. Yeah. Mike? Thank you, Sheila. And thank you, Denise, for that summary of such mm -hmm. incredible work that's happening, mm -hmm. um, not only in the, in the Northwest, but that's happening in UCC churches and particularly in Just Peace churches across this country. Mm -hmm. And I think, Denise, you summed up well uh, the difference of, of, of why become a Just Peace church. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's that, it's that question of intention. It's that question of uh, shared networking and resources. As the United Church of Christ, we often say our motto is courage in the struggle for justice and peace. And part of that implies of, as part of being a Just Peace Church that we're offering encouragement to one another in this work. Uh, that is part of our goal. So as part of that encouragement um, is, to, is to be uh, uh, prophetic and to be public with our values. And so part of the way to do that is to mark Just Peace Sunday. Okay. Uh, so this year, um, as Denise somewhat alluded to, uh, our theme for Just Peace Sunday, which is this Sunday, the 18th, is breaking through the disruptive power of just peace. And the image, um, uh, Jennifer, if you, could, if you could pull up that website, the image that you'll see is the uh, a flower breaking through concrete that we've, we as a steering committee, as we developed resources for this year, felt like uh, right now we need a breakthrough of peace and justice in our world. As, as we all know so well, uh, we are a world at, at war in many spots around the world, but most notably in Europe, in Ukraine. And so we focused a lot on the need to disrupt uh, violence and the need, the, the potential, potentially disruptive power of just peacemaking. And we reflected a lot on this passage from Ephesians, Ephesians 2 verses 14 through 22, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. At this time, we need to break down those dividing walls between us uh, and we need a breakthrough in our world uh, as we've remained mired in a pandemic and face the continued challenges of a climate crisis, systemic racism, economic disparity, and threats to human rights and our democracy. Mm -hmm. So we hope you will join us in, in marking Just Be Sunday. And there, as you can see on the website, there's the liturgical resources there, as well as some uh, links to some of our other resources, as Sheila mentioned, the handbook earlier, uh, which is a great resource for you. Uh, but we've also been blessed to have a word of invitation from our own general minister and president, Reverend John Dorhauer, who uh, has invited all of us to participate in this year's Just Be Sunday. And I think, Jennifer, if you could queue up that video to hear John's voice of welcome. Greetings to all of our churches across the United Church of Christ. I'm John Dorhauer, and I serve as General Minister and President 
of this denomination, one that affords me many opportunities to bear witness to your collective commitments to build a just and peaceful world. I am inspired and I, have over, I am overwhelmed by your acts of love and your commitments to show your courage in the struggle for justice and peace. Everywhere we look today, the just peace that we long for is being jeopardized by a growing pandemic of fear, hatred, violence, warfare, and avarice. And I'm inviting us all to join our voices in the call to build a just peace in and for our world. We need a breakthrough, a, a breakthrough of commitment to end the climate crisis and reverse the ecological devastation that threatens our planet and life itself a breakthrough of political will to end the crisis of gun violence in our communities, a breakthrough of justice to reverse years of systemic racism, economic disparity, all of which diminish the livelihoods of many, a breakthrough of peace to end the war in Ukraine and all wars. So Sunday, September 18th is marked in the United Church of Christ is Just Peace Sunday. Won't you please join your sibling churches around the country and create a worship experience that lifts up the call to a just peace. Together, we can break through the barriers of fear and hate. Together, we can break through to build a lasting and just peace. Together, we can shine Christ's light of love into the world and realize God's vision of shalom. I look forward to hearing more, more about and bearing witness to your commitments to build a just world for all. Thank you. That was excellent. Um... Mm -hmm. I should note uh, on, in the, the Just Peace resources that you'll see on that website, a shout out to our colleagues from Eden Seminary. I see Mary Cheryl Balfus has joined us. And so thank you. Uh, the resources are written in part by members of the Just Peace Steering Committee and in part by some of the faculty and leadership of, of Eden Seminary. So we're grateful for their partnership in this year's materials. Back to you, Sheila. Well, <laughs> We have been blessed with so many um, resources and, and the wonderful video from our general minister and president, John Dorhauer. Very excited about um, Just Peace Sunday coming up. So thank you so much, Mike, for the overview of that. And we hope that you all join us in celebrating Just Peace Sunday, which is now a nice segue to our Q&A. We invite you to ask us questions. We've been speaking for a while now and we want to hear from you. So please, um, if you have a question, invite, you know, we're, we're inviting you to ask your questions to us at this time and hopefully we can answer it. Let's see. Sheila, I have one question here. Okay. Uh, and this could probably be for any of the three of us, uh, but, the theme for Just Be Sunday talks about the disruptive power. Yes. I'm wondering if uh, the question is, what is that disruptive power of Just Peace? And can we each uh, say something about uh, uh, what that is? And I'd be happy to, I can- I, I would like to share just a story. Right. Um, yeah, and, and please, I would love to hear every voice here. But there is this story that was shared with me in Germany about, um, what I guess the people of the Ukraine did um, when they were invaded. Um, the Russian soldiers were looking for signs to tell them which way to go, left, right, or whatever. And the people totally threw them off. It was a very peaceful, uh, nonviolent way of um, not allowing the signage to let them know which direction to go. And to me, that was disruptive. <laughs> you know, it was disruptive because um, it threw off their plan. 
And it was a very peaceful way to do it. Um, so I just wanted to share that story. Um, and there are so many other stories, like even in our civil rights movement with the people just marching um, peacefully. And even recently in the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, people just marching peacefully to say, hey, our lives matter too. Um, why can't we have equal rights? So I, I see, um, how we can have this disruption of the status quo um, by our actions um, and our peaceful actions. And they are powerful, disruptive, and they work. So I would love uh, to hear from Mike. Uh, Denise, you know, you, you were- Denise, do you want to go next? Say, uh, well, I would just say uh, that one thing that I really think works to be disruptive is the churches that are getting involved with houselessness and providing, everybody's saying, there's nothing we can do. We've got this terrible situation, you know, homeless people all over our streets, nobody does anything. And so you kind of get, the ball just rolls that way where you feel powerless. And I think all these folks that are putting um, homes, small that they be, on their properties really disrupts that momentum. And I, I think that's a good concrete example of change in status quo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, two things came to mind for me. Um, the first is there are, uh, in the Just Peace practices, there are disruptive practices that um, uh, Susan Thistlethwaite and Glenn Stassen, who co-wrote that book, uh, have proposed such as taking independent initiatives to reduce threat. So essentially there's a, a call for preemptive peacemaking. Uh, we talk about preemptive war, uh, but they are, uh, there's, a, there's a principle of preemptive peacemaking. So trying to disarm uh, ahead of time uh, in ways that kind of can unravel uh, violence and tension in a conflict situation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one, and I think Sheila, to your point, the example that you lifted up from U Ukraine of Ukrainians changing the road signs pointing in the wrong direction <laughs> of the tanks rolling into their cities. That's another disruptive tactic. Uh, and there are many, many more. I, I would say though, in you and there's a question here in the chat of, um, have you talked about how to disrupt peace in the war in Ukraine? Uh, those are examples, but um, I know here in DC, we're, uh, I'm connected to some of the peace movements, um, one of which uh, has actually brought a religious delegation to Kyiv uh, at the invitation of the mayor of, of Kiev that um, wanted to call on his city to become a city of peace. And so as response to that, uh, faith leaders joined there and were a, a peace presence. Um, to draw national attention to the fact that it was in fact secure, uh, but more so just to be to pray for peace and to uh, you know meet with partners and encourage them in the disruptive peacemaking that they were part of uh, there in Ukraine. Uh, there's other examples I could pick up as well, but um, I wanted to move to what maybe a slightly similar question that came in from Kathleen, who says, uh, "I describe our denomination." the UCC as being into social action. Is just peace more than that? Denise, you somewhat touched on this. Uh, do you wanna to respond to that one first? How was just peace? Oh my gosh, I, I could talk way too long about that. <laughs> I think it goes back to what I was saying about intention yeah. because it's kind of like, um, with just peace, you work through all these issues that I addressed and all of you addressed with the intent for justice, because a peace uh, without justice isn't peace. You know, it, it, people are, are suppressed and repressed. So I would say, you know, it is very intentional about bringing out peace. You can feed a bunch of people, but if you don't deal with the issues of food insecurity, you're just going to keep spinning your wheels. So I would say it's intention, really. And to always think that whatever outreach project you're working on, that your intent is for it to create justice, which will lead to true peace. That's a lot. That's, but it's tough, but I think you can do it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree 100% with Denise. And it's a great question because I think a lot of people have that question when we're talking about just peace and matters of justice and peace. They're wondering, is, it, is this social justice? And I get that question sometimes. And, you know, my response is similar to Denise's in that coming from a congregational context, a lot of times it's what's important in your context. What does the congregation feel like its issues are? And that's usually a good place to start. Um, and then it can grow. Um, that happened in my congregation, but it happens in so many congregations. So um, Denise exampled in her story how when she arrived, they were going through the ONA process. And then, you know, becoming a Just Peace Church incorporates um, ONA and incorporates green, it, it incorporates everything. Um, because we're dealing with all matters of justice and peace. And that becomes so important in the life of a congregation because there's so many issues that can arise at any given time. And we tend to want to be able to respond to that. And this is a, a good way to do that um, faithfully. So yes, it does incorporate uh, matters of social justice, if, especially if that's what your congregation is focused on but it also um, incorporates matters of the environment or creation in general. And I think that it's, it's really good to understand just peace in this framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, uh, I agree. I would add, um, you know, it, it is a matter of intention as, as Denise said, but it's also a matter of intersection. Uh, that really the, the Just Peace pronouncement, I think, is one of the most beautiful theological articulations that the UCC has um, issued about its a self-identifying um, value. Mm -hmm. um, and if you read it, it really is an intersectional vision of shalom uh, before we really use the term intersectional, at least that I use the term intersectional now. Yeah. Um, and as a result, it, it pushes us, I hope, beyond just seeing this as social action or, or especially of charity. I don't think, I think there's a difference between social action and charity, but it's, it, is a, it is, to Denise's point, an intention to get to the root causes of these issues, mm -hmm. but also to see how those root causes uh, you know, affect violence and right. conflict right. And, and brings, uh, offers I think some helpful guidance in how um, how to make those connections, uh, right. and we found as we've walked with churches uh, through their discernment and uh, covenant processes, it also pulls us into areas that we may not be comfortable in. So you may be comfortable working on on local issues in your community, uh, but you don't have any global partnerships, and so Just Peace is pulling us toward also incorporating global partnerships, or you may be interested in working on environmental issues, but you really haven't touched issues of tax justice or poverty in your community. And so the holistic vision and particularly the, the World Council uh, four areas of just peace with the earth, in the marketplace, in the community and among nations, I think is a challenge for us to, to touch on all those areas, knowing that they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, and that only when we really are addressing all of them uh, and their intersections will we ever live into the vision of shalom that we see promised in, uh, in our scriptures. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many designations you can choose to do in your churches. You know, ONA, Green Church, all these different things that you can do. And what I tell churches that I work with, and I've been working with churches from you know, tip of Washington down to Southern California is I said, you know, you can be all of those things without being a just peace church, but you can't be a just peace church without being all of those things because it's the umbrella above all of them. So I try to encourage people, like if they're torn between what they want to do, become a just peace church and then do what you do best. Do you in your congregations. I think that's it for questions, Sheila. Okay, well, 
Those were excellent questions. And I think that kind of brings us towards our close. We only have five more minutes. So thank you so much for being present with us and listening to what it means to be a Just Peace Church. And we hope and pray that you might explore becoming a Just Peace Church because we need you. We need you uh, to join us and to join this important movement because justice and peace is just as relevant today as it was about 35 years ago. And we have so many concerns and so many issues that need our attention, care, and love. And so we hope that you will join us. And we have a wonderful benediction to close us out. And Reverend Denise is going to lead us in that benediction. This uh, benediction is in your materials for Just Peace Sunday, and it's written by Reverend Dr. Damianthi Niles. He's from Eden Theological Seminary, and we are working on a partnership with Eden that's growing even as we speak here today. And this is the prayer that he wrote. Holy architect of peace, help us to participate in your vision of peace. The vision that sees the value of all that listens to all the parts of the cosmos in all of its diverse abundance, but with a particular care for the weakest and the most easily silenced. Help us to be champions of the weak and contesters of the voices that do silence. So the creatures that you have loved into being might be part of the ebb and flow of the dynamic conversation that makes your peace. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has enhanced your ministry or healed your soul in any way, please consider donating to support the annual fund of the United Church of Christ Simply text UCC to 41444. Your support will help build more programs like this. We thank you for your support. Be blessed and be a blessing and know that you are not alone. We are holding you in prayer. Amen.